All right, great. Well, listen, we're, we're continuing this series from um, the book of 1 John. And we know there's, there's 1 John, there's 2 John, there's 3 John. They do cover kind of similar things. 1 John is the one that's more comprehensive. It covers uh, uh, you know, everything in that. And the other ones are a little bit shorter. They're actually only a chapter each. So we're focusing on 1 John. Um, I start the series off, remember, by talking about living in the light and about how we as, as Christians... Our goal is to live in the light, but the way we do that is by accepting God's grace, by trying to live as righteous as possible, yes, but also realizing that when we don't quite meet the mark, which we all miss the mark, it doesn't mean we're out of God's light. It just means that God's just continually pouring his grace out on us. And if we just accept that grace, then we get to live in the light constantly because that's what God wants for us. Constant relationship, constantly pouring out his grace on us. Then Leah looked last week about how to build intimacy from chapter 2, which if you look at it in the, uh, the, tr- the Passion Translation, it actually uses the, the term. It's talking about, most of you, because um, the Passion Translation is not a very common translation, most of you will have read it, and it will say something, I think it says something on the lines of, to be in Jesus. But the Passion Translation translates like this, to be intimate with Jesus. And so Leah talked about how do we build intimacy with our Lord and Saviour, that was last week. And then today, I'm going to continue this series by looking at chapter 3. Now, um, so what I've done is, right, it's funny, isn't it, how sometimes you, you see people and you, and you see like a resemblance to, some, to someone else. Like, me and Leah have this kind of running joke where we're, we're driving down the street and we'll see someone that's like, like the most minutely like someone else in the church. And we'll go, oh, so-and-so's there. And they'll go, what? And they'll go, oh. You know, and it's like, <laughs> it's obviously nothing, but it's funny, like, because you can do it all the time. And we get each other all the time. So it's funny. So I've, I've actually prepared some lucky likeys for this morning, okay? So um, I've got them on the screen for you. So here we go. So this is my dad back in the day, okay? This is young Andrew. And so um, one thing that I've always, one person I've always thought dad looked like was Magnum P.I., <laughs> right, Tom Selleck, all right? You had to have the moustache to see it, but it's true, okay? Um, who else we got? We've got Trevor. I don't think Trevor's here today. Who could Trevor look like? <laughs> Only Sean Connery. Come on. You can see, now you've seen it, you'll never unsee it. You'll never unsee it. Come on. Terence, he's also not here, he's skiving. No, he's at home recovering. Um, Terence, who about Terence look like? Come on. John Travolta. And of course, Rachel just completes it. <laughs> who else we got? Tozin, is Tozin here? Tozin, give us a wave. Who might Tozin look like? Only Kevin Hart. Come on. It's like twins. We got any more? Dave, now. Dave, the reason why I picked this one, I think, is more actually, I can imagine you saying a certain phrase this person says. Now, you can't say it because it's church, but I can imagine you saying you're only supposed to blow the doors off. Anyway. (laughs) And last but not least, and when you see this, you're like, you'll be like, Luke. Ollie Mears, obviously. <laughs> Ollie Mears. It's like we're brothers. Look at that. <laughs> now, now, the reason why I do that, I show all that, is because actually, you know when you see somebody and they're part of a family, like, like in the Jenkinson family, if you were to have like my dad and all his brothers um, like side by side, there's certain characteristics about them. We call it the Jenkinson nose. Right? They all look really similar. Like even like my, myself and my brothers, it's, it's very similar. We all have this kind of this um, family resemblance. Now you don't always, not everyone looks exactly the same, but you know there's like there's there's things that make them look similar to each other. This is family um, resemblance. In fact, I remember one time, I'm going to take you back to a time before time, 26 years ago, 1997, at my dad's 40th birthday party. I, um, I, I lived in horror 
after that moment because I saw a picture of my dad and I thought it was me. I thought it was me with like darker hair. And I was like, why, why is my picture? I was like, oh, it's, it's my dad. <laughs> and so I remember being young. I was like, I, people were like, oh, you're just like your dad. And I'm like, no, no, no. I wanted to be like, no, I'm not like my parents. But you know what? As you grow up, you realize, actually, you are. And you grow to really like that, actually. I mean, I love who my mum and dad are. And I'm glad that I get to be like them because they're fantastic people. But there's, there's, everyone has a, we have a family resemblance, don't we? A family likeness. And this is what it talks about a little bit in 1 John 3. So um, can we have the first verse, the 1 John 3 verse 1. It says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. I can see the exclamation mark. It's almost like he shouted, and that's what we are. It's almost like it's so shocking, so unbelievable, that like God would love us so much that he calls us his Father, that we are his children. That's what we are. It's important because throughout the Bible, the Bible lays a foundation for our relationship with God. We are not his servants, although we are. We're not his slaves, although the Bible does say, you know, you're not a slave to sin anymore, but you're a slave to righteousness. But the very foundational relationship that we are to God is we are his children. That is the main theme throughout the Bible. Romans 8, verse 15, you can follow it on the screens. The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again, but rather the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Abba means daddy. It's like the kind of thing where you, it's a young child who's just absolutely in adoration of their parent. They're their entire world. And they know that wherever they're with that parent, they are safe and secure, loved, um, wherever they're in their presence. And that's what we can cry to our father. You know, it says that we are adopted into sonship. So we've become a part of his family and we're sons. You know, sometimes I would imagine if I was a lady, um, I don't imagine that often, but imagine if I was a lady, I would read certain parts of the Bible and I would think, well, I'm a daughter, not a son. But you know, there's a reason why the Bible uses the term son. Rather, It's true, we are just, we're sons, we're daughters of God. But the reason why it uses sons is because back in the day, when the Bible was written and the way that their society and culture was built, the daughter would be married off into another family and taken care of by them. But the sons received all the inheritance and the sons were the ones who were given authority from the father to run the family business. And so what he's saying is, if we're adopted as children into God's family, we name as sons because he says, I want to give everything I've got to you your inheritance, your eternal inheritance, and I want to give you power and authority. You can act in my name. Whoever prays in the name of Jesus will see what he's asking for. That's what God's given us. We're adopted into God's family. Amen. God uses family as its main example for our relationships with God and each other. And it chooses the closest relationships in society to illustrate our relationship with God and with each other. It refers to God as the groom. And it refers to the church as his bride. The church collectively. And it refers to us individually as the children all those, close, the Bible uses those close relationships all the time to, to, and it tells us as well that we, we're not just children of God, we're also brothers and sisters. So constantly the Bible is reinforcing this idea, family, family, family. And I know family isn't always the best experience for some people. You may have come from a broken family or a difficult family or, or maybe you feel that you've not been a good parent or, 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 or whatever, whatever you may, there may be the reason for why you perhaps don't have a positive experience of family. But I want to tell you, God's family 
is the best family. It's the example to all families of what family should be. Family, when it works as it should, as God intended it, is one of the best systems in the world. When people are rooted in a family, in a healthy family, they thrive. And so that's what God's given us when we've joined this family. It goes on to to say in 1 John 3 then, 1 John 3 verse 1 still, but the second half, it says, the reason the world does not know us is it didn't know him. You see, there's a family resemblance. So the reason why the world doesn't know us, it doesn't recognise us, as it looks at us and thinks you're a bit different, you don't feel quite the same, you don't act quite the same, you don't smell quite the same, is because they didn't know God. And if you're thinking to yourself today, like, you know, being a Christian's hard because, you know, we have to act differently and speak differently and do things differently, and I'm tired of telling people I'm a Christian and they look at me weird and, and, and I'm embarrassed sometimes. I say, I want to tell you, that's what it's all about. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to stand out because we resemble our Father in heaven. If you're going to clap, because he deserves the praise. That's why we say that, because he deserves the praise. If you're going to clap, we clap. He doesn't know us, he doesn't recognize us, because we are different. We shouldn't fit in. In fact, he goes on to say later on in 1 John 3, in verse 13, don't be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. And the thing is, this must have been their experience, you know. That's not just words. This must have been their experience. Dave Little was, was just explained to me Leah recently about what it must have been like for Christians when that was written. Those people in Ephesus, John 1 John, was, it was written, we believe, to the churches in Ephesus and passed around because they were living in a Gentile world. So, but even if they weren't, even the Christians who were living in the Jewish world, they would have been different. They had a whole religious system and the Christians were doing it different. In Ephesus, they had their whole religious system. Everyone had gods in their homes. Everyone sacrificed. In fact, everyone believed that if they sacrificed to their gods and they pleased their gods, that rain would fall and that crops would grow. And you know what? If there's a bad harvest, whose fault is it? The Christians. Because they don't have gods in their home and they don't go and sacrifice to idols like we do. They're not honouring and worshipping their gods because we did it differently. And so the world will be looking at them and thinking, you're the ones to blame why my field isn't reaping the crops that I thought it was going to reap. So don't be surprised if the world hates you. And the reason why John knows is, I said this uh, in my preach two weeks ago, the reason why John can say that confidently is because John heard it from the horse's mouth. John heard Jesus say these very words. In John 15 verse 9, he quotes Jesus saying, If you belong to the world, it will love you as its own. But as it is, you do not belong to the world. But I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. We're called out of the world to grow in family resemblance to God so that when people look at you, they think, Ah, there's someone from the Christ family. There's Luke Christ. There's Rupert Christ. There's Daniel Christ. There's Mick Christ. Because they're looking, they're saying, they've got the same nose. (laughs) I want Jesus' nose. (laughs) And it goes on to say, in 1 John 3 verse 2 now, it says, Dear friends... Now we are children of God. What we will be has not yet been known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. A similar verse to that is in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12. It says, for we now see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then... We will see him face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. So it was, we're growing now in in, in a family resemblance to God, but one day Jesus is coming back. And right now we have an understanding of who God is, but when Jesus comes back, there'll be like an aha moment where we go, ah, that's fully who when you see Jesus in his glory and we're transformed to be just like him we're like ah that's 
who my saviour really fully is right now where you understand a part of it. In, in fact, mirrors in those days, the reason why it says that about mirror, because you might be thinking, well, when I look in the mirror, it's pretty clear. I can see myself. I look beautiful. Checking my hair in the morning. But in those days, a mirror was a polished bit of metal. Like you could see, if you polished it well, you could see, but you couldn't see that well. You know what I mean? You could see kind of a vague approximation of yourself in the reflection. And that's what he's saying. He says, we see Jesus now one way, but one day we're going to see him fully. And then we'll just complete our transformation into the resemblance of Jesus one day. It goes on to say in 1 John 3 verses 10, it says, uh, this is how we know who the children of God are then and who the children of the devil are. Okay, any parents with toddlers can say amen to that. You're like, I know who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child. Now I'm going to go back two weeks to my message about 1 John 1 when I was saying, that's not saying that we have to be perfect. It's not saying that if you do something wrong, you suddenly don't become a child of God. It's just saying it's those who are living in the light it's talking about, those who are working to, be, to, to, to grow their family resemblance, to make right and good choices, which is why Andy's grow group is so important. Life's healing choices, that group's going to help people make good choices and help them recognise bad choices and show, hopefully show that from the Bible. We're, we're choosing to live that way and we might mess up occasionally, but then we can still come to God in grace we're still living in the light so it's not saying that people have to be perfect to be God's children but it's just saying we have to continue in the grace of God it's on to say that anyone who does who does not do what is right is not God's child but it says nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister and this is this for this is the message you heard from the beginning. Beginning of what? Beginning of John's ministry. Beginning of when they were saved. It's what John says he's been teaching them over and over and over and over again since the first opportunity he's had to teach them anything. He's like, I've been saying this from the start, guys. It's about how we love each other. This is how people know that you are part of the family of God. It's if you are working to live righteously and you are loving each other. So we talked about living righteously. We talked about living the light in the first week. I want to focus now more on the loving each other. It goes on to say we should love one another. In other words, when people outside of God's family, outside the church, look in and see us, they will know we are Christ followers by the way we live and the way we love. How we interact with each other is what will tell them that we are part of God's family. It goes on to say in verse 12 of chapter 3, Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil, his brothers were righteous. Don't be, dis- be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. But know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Can we hear, just, I just want to take a moment, can we hear the gravity? We know we have passed from death to life. He's talking about salvation. We know we have been saved from eternal damnation. How? Because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. That's a bit harsh, isn't it? (laughs) But this is John... This is John who heard from the horse's mouth. And this is what Jesus said. Well, sorry, I haven't got the quote actually. Jesus, when he was talking about hatred and things like lust, Jesus said that if you you have these in your heart, you've already committed them. 
Like if you have lust in your heart for another, another woman other than, your, other than your wife, you've already committed adultery because you've done it in your heart. And he, said, and he said the same thing about hatred. If you have hatred in your heart, you might not actually murder somebody, but the, the, the feeling is there. The desire is there. And that desire is actually the root of sin in your heart. So he's saying that we, we shouldn't be having hatred in our hearts for our brother and sister. He said, who is our brother and sister? Well, Jesus actually made this really clear. In Matthew 12, verse 21, 25, when they told him, your, your mother and your brother is, is here and wants to see you, he said, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And pointing to his disciples, he said, here is my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. Whoever does the will of the Father. I want to just, take, I want to just label this a little bit because I'm talking about loving each other. I'm actually not even talking about loving the people out there. I, I, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, obviously. We should love people. It's how we communicate often the gospel to people. We share God's love with people, right? Absolutely. But what he's talking about right now is love for each other. Brother and sisters, that, that is what's going to actually be the thing that speaks to people out there. They look at our community and they say, those people, I want to be a part of that community because I can see how they love each other. So how do we love each other? Well, 1 John 3, 16 talks about this. It says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay our lives down for our brothers and sisters. That's massive. That's huge. Using Jesus' example of how he laid his life down. Listen, how many, I, 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 I'm, I'm just like you. I'm like, we're all the same. You have those thoughts, don't you? I'm not going to help that person. Because they should know better. <laughs> Or, I don't want to help that person because I, I've worked hard for this money. I deserve it. You know, I'm not going to help that person because they smell. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? We can find so many reasons not to help people. But actually, looking out for people is one of the chief ways that we show love to each other. And it's so simple and it's so beautiful. I, I sometimes get in my own head a little bit. And I think about all the things that I've done that make me look I'm so great. So great. I'm such a servant and I've done all these things. And I remember times that I've given to people and all this type of stuff. And I can have a little, little moment of arrogance and, and, and whatever. And, but you know what humbles me? Is when God reminds me, yeah, but... And I start to list all the things that people in this family have done for me. And people, other Christians, because they're all part of the same family, other Christians outside this church have done for me. And I'm like, oh, I've never done a, near as much as what's been done for me. And we have a saying, don't we? You can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. No matter how much you try, you can't outgive him. Because you reap what you sow. <laughs> you give and God gives back anyway. You can't, but I just think of the times, the times where, like really rough times we've had as a family, where we've had nothing. I remember times where we've sat and we had to decide to cook dinner for the kids because we couldn't we have enough food for all of us. And then someone showed up at the door who didn't even know and they bought bags of shopping because God had told them to. I can think of, not just once, I'm talking about a few, I can think of times where people have taken us, I've told, I've told you this before, but people have taken us to their home because they've heard that we we're in need and they've emptied their cupboards and fridge. I, can, I, know, I know times where people have just put money anonymously through our door and it just came at just the right moment. I can think of times, people, people have given us, it's, it's embarrassing, people have given us vehicles People, there have been, they've been so many times where we've not, not been able to go on holiday and yet someone at the last minute has just enabled it for us somehow. It's just, it's humbling. It's family. 
This is what it means to be the family of God. It's looking out for each other. One John three. So just again carrying on in one John three. Now verse seventeen eighteen. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Of course, it's not saying that we don't say encouraging things to each other. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. What it's saying is don't stop at words. Don't talk about doing great things and never actually do them. If you see someone in need, it's our God-given privilege to help them. Can I wait on God for a minute? <laughs> can spiritualize at any moment, can't you? Um, I think it's more a battery issue because we don't want to preach with them, but I didn't want to be sniffing. I thought, like, if I cough, I can go. That's why. I'm all right. I'm all right. I don't want to blow my nose on stage. We're okay. <laughs> so um, it's our God-given privilege to be able to step in. And you know what? It is embarrassing at times when people do that for you. You feel a measure of embarrassment along with the love. I've got to tell you though, you know what? Whatever you enable someone, you allow them to, to love on you, you're, you're enabling them. If we all turn around and say, no, don't want any help, if we're all just stubborn and say, no, no, I can do it on my own, then nobody can give anything to anybody. And they will be blessed for blessing you. So don't rob them of that blessing. That's family. The second way in which we can love each other is our words. Again, so simple, but so powerful. I, I put some about this in the, the monthly newsletter that goes out from the church. There's a little section there. If you haven't got a newsletter, you can sign up on our website or at the Connections Point. And there's a little section there where we give a little bit of a, a blurb, a little bit of a, an encouragement for the, the month. And, and I talked to him then about that. And it's the same similar kind of thought. 1 John 3, verse 16, it says, Don't be like Cain, who murdered, sorry, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil, his brothers were righteous. We, we just read that, right? That's pretty harsh. And I don't think that the reason why John was writing that to the churches in Ephesus was because there was an epidemic of murders happening. I don't think that church was struggling with murder in particular. Um, but I got thinking about our words, and there's that verse in Proverbs 18.21 that says, The tongue has the power of life and death. And those who love it will eat fruit. You can murder somebody with your words. You can destroy them. You can even, like, let's say, let's say, let's say me and Andy are chatting. And, and, I'm, and like Andy, Andy's great pals with, with Tez, and uh, he really likes Tez, and they're, they're, good, they're good pals. And, uh, but, I, but I've got an issue with Tez. And uh, I go to Andy, I'm like, we're just chatting. He says, hey, you know what? You know what Tez did the other day? He said this. I'm so angry, I'm so annoyed. And I start telling Andy all my side of the issue with Tez. Not even, maybe not even spoken to Tez about it. But I'm telling Andy about this whole thing because I feel righteous. I feel justified. I feel like I'm, I'm right and Tez is wrong. And actually, it might even be that I'm the one who's wrong, but Andy will never know because Tez isn't there to defend himself. And so I'm telling Andy. And so all of a sudden then, not that Andy would do this because he's a very holy man, but in his mind, Tez, the man that he thought Tez was, dies. And he's replaced with a different version of Tez because of the words that I've said to him. We have to be very, very, very careful with what we say. Yes. Words have power. And I'm laboring that a little bit because I want it to drive it home because we forget it so many times. And we, and we talk about people. And we, we have such an amazing privilege to flip that on its head. And talk life to people all the time. 
You can completely change someone's perspective when they're talking if you speak faith, if you speak life, if you speak encouragement, and if you make a commitment to only speak those things. And I know, and we'll get on to this in a minute, I know there'll be moments where you need to go to somebody and you need to deal with something with that person, right? But deal with it that person. Not with, don't deal with it with someone else. And don't just let those little comments slip out. And do, Why? Because we're a family and we're building up everyone. We're building up people all the time. You're going quiet now. You're thinking, well, I'm being told off. I'm not telling you off, right? Ephesians 4 verse 29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that they may benefit those who listen. That's actually translated in many other translations. And the literal meaning of it, that last bit there about where it says it may benefit those who listen, actually means that you'll give grace to those that listen. So when we're saying and building people up and saying positive things, you're sharing grace with people. You're gracing them. Isn't that beautiful? And so we want to be people, people who do that all the time. We grace people with our words we speak life and life reproduces it doesn't kill that's family that's God's family and the third thing is grace I want to talk about grace for a minute Matthew 5 verse 21 to 25 says you have heard that it was said to people long ago you shall not murder and anyone who murders a lot of murder in this preach anyone who murders will be subject to judgment but I tell you again um, I tell you that anyone who's angry with a brother or sister, will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka! That means stupid or idiot. No, I'm I'm being serious. I think it does. (laughs) Um, Is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift. There are, there are many other verses actually I could have used for this section, but I wanted that because it has both sides. It talks first of all as if, as if you're angry at someone else. And if you're like, if you hold on to that anger and even your mind has been twisted bitterly like stupid idiot. You know, if you're angry and you hold on to it, it says you're in risk of the fire of hell. Not because God wants to send you there as punishment for your anger, but because that anger, it will fester in you and bitterness will take root. But then it goes the other way. It tells you, actually, if you're about to give your gift at the altar, in other words, if you're about to worship God in the temple, in the church, with all your brothers and sisters around you, or you're about to put your offering in the offering bowl with all your brothers and sisters around you, and you know that somebody has got something against you. This is God speaking. Stop what you're doing. Stop the worship. I've never read this before until this week. Stop the worship and go and see him. Don't, don't Don't even worship until you've gone and spoke to that person and made it right. Wow. God's more bothered about our relationships than he is about receiving worship from us. We have a value here at Grace Church. We don't talk about that. We haven't talked about values for a while. You can go on our website. You can read our values. One of them is grace. We have grace for each other. We make allowances for each other. We appreciate and understand that we mess up and we give people another chance. And when people offend us, we forgive. Why? Because he first forgave us. And if, we've, if we can't get forgiveness right, we've missed the whole picture. Ephesians 4, verse 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ forgave you. It's the family resemblance. Colossians 3, verse 13. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you have a grievance against someone, against someone, forgive how? As the Lord forgave you. It's the family resemblance. Grace and forgiveness are hallmark attributes of the family of God. 
And we all nod our heads in agreement and say, yes, Luke, we must forgive people. And then someone upsets us and we take two weeks. Or we write them off. If we forgive God, sorry, if we forgive like God forgives, then we never write anyone off. That's family. You don't turn your back on your brother or your sister or your mother, do you? There might be a pain. It might be horrible, but the family. That's family. Can the band up, please? I want to just I want to read a whole passage from one John to you now, because this this idea gets continued on into chapter four, and it's wonderful. I'm not I'm not going to say. It. I just want to read it to you, because it explains it. It says it all. It affirms it all again. 1 John 4, verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love Mm. comes from God. Anyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. That he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the saviour of the world. And anyone that acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. And this is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. But the one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. And whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. My heart this morning is not, I'm not challenging any perceived idea that people don't love each other in this church. I want to challenge the idea of, What are you doing to show that love? Are you helping a brother and sister in need? Are you speaking words of life? Are you forgiving quickly and showing grace to people? If you are, you're loving like Jesus. And you're showing yourself to be a part of the family of Christ. Because you look like him. I want you to imagine this is our church. This is our church. And every time you speak those positive words over people, we grow a bit closer together. Every time you choose to forgive, when actually they were in the wrong, we move a bit closer together. Every time we have grace, for each other every time someone is in need and you step out and you do something to help them out we grow a little closer a bit closer and a bit closer I don't want to live in a church like this we're connected but we're not close this is is a church 
where people come on a Sunday and they come in at the last 20 seconds of the countdown they find a seat at the back and then they leave in the last worship song or maybe when the announcements are given and then they go away and they don't see anyone for the rest of the week well this is a uh, this is a, a church family where people are thinking about themselves all the time and the way they go about things it's all about what they deserve what they need and the church is not serving my needs and and, 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 and actually you know, I don't want to I don't want to help out and I don't want to serve in a team I've got things to do I'm a busy person I don't want to live in this kind of church and I, I don't think that anyone here wants to be the type of person that builds church this way I want to live in a church where we're so close This is the church that we're building at Grace Church. So I want to challenge you today. This is not just a wishy-washy, lovey-dovey message. I want you to think. When you bump into somebody in Asda that you know from church, don't be like, oh, hey, you're all right, you're, yeah, I'm all right, yeah, and go. <laughs> no, well, that was then. Speaking in tongues. I want you to stop have a moment together how's your week can I pray or even just just think of something nice to say do you know what sometimes we think it's hard to find something nice to say it's really not if you're in the habit of doing it never say something that's false that's called flattery but I promise you if you get in the habit you will be able to find something nice that's true all the time but it, it, you have to cultivate it as a habit. Let's build this. Amen. Amen. Amen.